uh, today I'm gonna show you some rather special place. This is Utterby Mine, and Utterby was uh, one of the places that has contributed to making the periodic table. And Utterby actually has contributed really enormously because it gave rise to four elements, four rare earth elements, and it has helped uh, uh, define another four. So here we have this magic place, and uh, as it says here, it's an historic place for chemistry and mineralogy and geochemistry. Utterby mine was uh, quarried already back in the 15th century for quartz mainly, which was used in iron smeltering. And then later in the 1780s, 1790s, it became important for um, feldspar, for porcelain making. And um, the feldspar comes from a pegmatite up there, and I'll show that to you a little later. And uh, the pegmatite also has some dark veins, some dark minerals, and that's where the rare earth elements are contained. And uh, I'll show you the veins a little later. The veins are actually radioactive, so we have to be a little careful with that. But that's where yttrium, ytterbium, erbium, and terbium were first of all extracted from and named, but also scandium, holmium, and um, um, tulium, and... Uh, yet more. So here we have actually a little bit of rubble on the ground and it's quite uh, good because here we have the feldspar. This is a nice potassium feldspar, slightly pink. It's got a beautiful cleavage and there's much larger ones here. I'll pick up some. So this is the feldspar and uh, sorry that was a quartz. Here's the feldspar and you see the cleavage, beautiful crystal faces and uh, this is what was mined for the porcelain industry and um, this was really going strong 1800 to 1870 and uh, already prior to that there was quartz mining and here I'll pick up some of the grey quartzes and uh, they are often um, not as well shaped. They often have um, surfaces that were attached to feldspar. And this is the kind of uh, shapes you see here. Here you see the attached feldspar. And this was used in uh, iron smeltering because quartz has a really high melting point And it was therefore very useful in the iron industry, which was going strong in central Sweden since the Middle Ages. So I would say, We'll go up the stairs and have a little look there. So guys, come with me. So have a look here. There is large fragments of quartz and feldspar. The pinkish rock there is a feldspar, The one with the cleavage and the more irregular grayish white rock there. That's the quartz, the quartz aggregate. And this is what was really mined here. But there's also some darker lumps in there. They're smaller. And that is part of the overlying country rock. And some of the pegmatites contain these dark veins. And there the mineral gadolinite was first extracted. And the chemist Gadolin, he was the one who really were, was able to extract these rare earth elements. And uh, therefore the mineral was named after him. And I'm going to show that to you in outcrop. Once we're up there, then we're going to see a little more of that. So we are at the entrance to Itteby Quarry now. And uh, this is where the big shaft was located. It was going down to 170 meters, 174 even, below the surface here. And it was largely actually below the waterline, in fact. And uh, it was mining this pegmatite. And you can see that there's different rock types behind us. We'll go there in a minute, but if you come a little closer here, I'll show you some of the pegmatites here behind this thorny bush. There you see some of the large kefal spa, the pink one with the nice cleavage. And this is what the porcelain makers were interested in. Large, clean feldspar aggregates. And they mined us from about 1790 to about 1860. And uh, it's believed that uh, one of the chemists here, Gadolin, he was an acquaintance of Wedgwood, the porcelain maker in, uh, in Great Britain. And they were actually corresponding about the high quality of the raw materials here, to my understanding at least. I have some Wedgwood porcelain at home, my wife really likes it. And uh, 
Well, funnily enough, maybe some of it actually came from here, or some of the raw materials. And here we have a vein of quartz. And this is what was uh, quarried long before the uh, feldspar for porcelain making. As I said, this was actually useful in uh, the smeltering of iron here in Sweden. So we are now inside the quarry and uh, first of all I'd like to point out the country rock. It's the dark rock up there. It's got a very steep boundary dipping away from me and that's an amphibolite. Uh, this is about 1.85 giga years old and then the lighter colored rock further down here That's the pegmatite. It's a little younger and it seems to have intruded the amphibolite The pegmatite is a late stage crystallization product of a granitic magma and uh, What we have here is the feldspar and the quartz, but we also have concentrations of otherwise incompatible elements and uh, this is what is often mined to this day for uh, rare elements and also for large iron lithophile elements. And if you come a little closer, I'll show you the dark veins from which the first rare earth elements were extracted. And if we look over here, there you see these dark veins that have intruded the pegmatite, likely as a very, very late stage component. So there must have been fluids that were migrating into the pegmatite and they were solidifying there. And so I have my little list here and uh, the following elements are named after this site here. That's yttrium, erbium, terbium and iterbium, all coming from the name Itterby. And uh, then uh, the following elements were also located or were also extracted from material here. That's holmium, named after Stockholm, tulium, Tula is the old name for Scandinavia, then Scandium, Scandinavia, and Gadolinium after the chemist Gadolin, who was the person who extracted this. And uh, material from here was also involved in extracting Niobium and Tantalum. And indeed, this is actually a, a Niobium and Tantalum pegmatite, as opposed to a Lithium pegmatite. That's the two broad types. And um, this material here has gadolinite, the mineral gadolinite, named in honor after gadolin. The uh, mineral was first uh, picked up by an army officer, Carl Axel Arrhenius, in 1787, and he sent a sample of the dark material that intrigued him to um, his friend gadolin. And gadolin then, in years of work, extracted a new element. He didn't use the word element that was not around back then, it was called an earth, and because it was a rare, strange earth, he called it a rare earth. And that's where the term rare earth elements effectively comes from, from Gadolin. And uh, this material has then given rise over the next several hundred years to uh, the discovery of several of these elements. And this was concluded in the early um, 20th century, 1903 or so, where when uh, all these elements had now eventually been defined. This makes this, place to, uh, uh, this makes this place one of the key places for chemistry and there's no other place on the planet that given rise to more discoveries of elements than this quarry with potentially 10 elements of the periodic table going back to this place here. Certainly eight and uh, likely two extra ones, as I said, niobium and tantalum. They were also extracted from other materials, but material from this quarry probably played a role to our knowledge in their discovery as well. So, if there is some other place that gives uh, rise or gave rise to two elements, it's a big success, but this one here is unparalleled. No other place in the world has given rise to more elemental discoveries than Utterby Quarry. So, here we have this uh, rather peculiar radial feature. And uh, some people have suggested this might be from using dynamite. And indeed, dynamite was used here in the quarry, of course. But there's something intriguing. If you come a little closer, it seems that there's a concentration of dark material here. And there's some of these darker veins. And uh, there could be a connection here. So fluids might expand when they can 
when they rise up and get decompressed and they will increase in volume. So maybe this is a boiling fluid that uh, was involved in the intrusion of the dark veins and this could have even shattered the rock, the pegmatite rock surrounding it. So this radial features is, uh, is uh, well described in several of the theses that were done on this area here. But as I said, there is uh, different interpretations. Personally, I think a fracturing of the rock due to boiling fluids is uh, quite conceivable. And uh, if you come over here and uh, step along with me, then you see that uh, there's quite a lot of these veins. So uh, down here you see many of these dark veins and uh, they have a mix of minerals. There's sheet silicates in there, but there's also this famous mineral gadolinite and that is where the uh, rare earth elements are highly concentrated and you will find uh, the eight rare earth elements that I mentioned earlier, but also several other rare elements and um, incompatible elements that have been concentrated in these dark veins in a late stage, likely during the pegmatite evolution. So here's a little view from the outside into the quarry and we can see the contact zone between the dark amphibolite at the very top and the pegmatite below. So if you step a little closer to the wall, you uh, should be able to see that. There's also a very thin, about 10 centimeter thick contact zone between, or reaction zone between the amphibolite and the pegmatite. And further down in the quarry, you can see the dark veins and there's one vein that's cut along its length. So it looks like a massive thing, but it's actually very thin. It's uh, like a veneer on the surface there. And um, I stress once more, that is where the rare earth elements were contained, in the dark veins rather than in the quartz and feldspar rich component. And economically only the quartz and feldspar was mined effectively. And uh, scientifically, however, the dark veins are so super important for the rare earth definition. So here we have a little overview of the quarry, at least what's left. And as I said, there was a shaft going down 170 meters. And uh, after the quarry was no longer used in the 1860s, they stopped working the quarry. It was later then uh, actually used as a fuel storage by the Swedish military. And uh, there is still contamination from that period. And uh, then uh, at the end of the Cold War, there was no fuel stored there anymore, so this is no longer actually in any use. But there's still some open uh, shafts down there, I understand, but you need permission for that, which I have not obtained on this occasion. So, what is the importance here? Well, after the working for feldspar and for uh, quartz stopped, what remains is the discovery of the rare earth elements. And one of the important things is that we use rare earth elements not just for green technology, for um, uh, wind and uh, solar power in the solar panel. We also use it for IT technology and uh, many of those aspects. So, for instance, the camera in uh, your smartphone actually contains gadolinium and the screen contains yttrium and gadolinium and uh, several of the other elements that were discovered here because they are responsible for the colors on your screen in the smartphone. And uh, your smartphone contains several tens of milligrams of these elements, particularly yttrium and gadolinium, which were discovered at this place here. And because of the importance of this discovery, the rare earth elements, um, the American um, International Metal Association has put up a block here, and I'll show you this block here to commemorate the importance, the historical importance of this place. And uh, here we can see it, that's the ASM International has designated Itaby Mine, an historical landmark. Four periodic elements, yttrium, terbium, erbium and ytterbium were isolated from the black stone here, which contains the mineral gadolinite. And uh, as I said, several other elements were also extracted from this material, but they're not named after the place here. Um, there's holmium, there's uh, scandium, there is tulium, etc., etc., and of course, gadolinium. 
And uh, here is another plaque by the European Chemical Society. They kind of latched on to this kind of thing. And it says here, in recognition of the historical importance of the chemical discoveries and developments tied to the site and to the deep link between chemistry and European cultural heritage, the Itami Mine is awarded the Eurochem's Historical Landmark Award at European level. And this is rather new. It was done in uh, April 2019. Well, this year was done a little earlier, which dates back to 1989. So this is from the last century, and this is really kind of almost yesterday, certainly geologically speaking. So this was a little introduction to it to be quarry and the importance of rare earth elements. And uh, today we wouldn't have modern technology. Many of these technologies that we're using from IT to green technologies would not be possible without re these rare earth elements making this site, well, the mother load of rare earth elements, if you will. Economically, they were never really quarried here because you would need to quarry a lot of rock to get enough out. But the discovery goes back to this site. Thank you for your attention and I hope you'll join me soon again. And uh, well, I hope you enjoyed that little trip to Itabi Quarry.